Good morning again, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Hopefully everybody's got a bulletin. I uh, just want to point out, uh, Wednesday, we uh, can't do prayer to this week, uh, but I will still send out prayer requests, and we'll get those out. I'll be able to email those out to those that need them. And if you want to have the prayer requests, uh, please let me know. Uh, give me your email. Uh, I don't have everybody's email, but... Uh, a lot of it. So if you if you guys want the prayer request, uh, just give Maggie to me the email that you guys use, and we'll get that way. Everybody can still be praying for everybody. Um, look at this. Um, some Mark's got a birthday. Whoa. Surprise birthday. I'm gonna ride around the corner. <laughs> yes. Surprise. 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 <laughs> it's a surprise birthday. Yeah, I'll be surprised if anybody shows up. Oh, okay. <laughs> So that's right around the corner on um, Friday. That's Friday, right? Yeah. That's right. Friday, Friday, May 28th. And then the next day for folks, uh, uh, Richard Memorial at the uh, Royal <coughs> Remember Memorial Park here in Mount Vernon. Uh, once again, uh, at home or wherever, you get the, if you have three by five cards or something like that, want to write a small note uh, for Heather, uh, Remembrance of Richard, please do that. And bring it with you or get it to Heather uh, via text or anything like that. Family camps right around the corner, just like unbelievable. It's just like practically, I think it's like three weeks away or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the best news of all, what's that? We have a bathroom. Woo -hoo! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, yeah, we have a bathroom there because uh, Nora he has his uh, outhouse, uh, the, uh, the porta potties, but then they have the, the bathroom right next to the cabin, and the family was who runs the place and we're like, oh no, we don't want to have a bathroom. Uh, but John was like, no, he'll over he'll override the family and uh, we'll have a bathroom. So there you go. So yeah. plan for that. Uh, we're planning on, uh, just so you know, it's just like uh, we had a, a, two years ago when we had a family camp lap, because last summer we didn't do it. Uh, we had a really good time having a lot of meals together. So that's something we're gonna try to do again. Uh, so uh, keep an eye out for that. We'll be coordinate, having coordinated efforts for meals uh, for some of the stuff. So there you go. And if you have want any information about family camp, where it's going to be, when it's going to be, or besides the dates, uh, let me know, and I'll get that information to you. Okay. All right. Is there anything else going on? It's your wife's birthday. Yes, I know. I was going to get you. Oh, cost? Here's here's. Here's how the cost will be deferred for a family camp. Is when we do the meals, you help clean up. That's the cost. So that, there you go. So, and also, we're, we're, as we're looking at some of our meals, we know that some people have some potluck nature to it, so we'll have extraneous parts of the meals that people will bring. All right, so there you go. Any other questions, any other things going on? All right. On that note, let's pray and dive into the Word of God. Father God, we just thank you for this morning. And uh, Father, I just thank you for uh, Scripture, that, especially Scripture that gives us uh, a glimpse into spiritual realities that uh, go way beyond what we can ever think and know. Uh, because Father, on those things, Father, we especially are dependent upon you to move upon our hearts uh, with greater understanding and greater sense of awe uh, of what, you, what you're doing and what you're about and who you are. And uh, that existence, Lord, that we uh, on this side of heaven are not experiencing. And so, Father, I just pray that you would help us understand those things today and uh, make them part of our heart and life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel needs the microphone on. <laughs> Part 2 of Still on the Throne. Uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 10 through 12. So, in this chapter, Daniel's been given this encompassing uh, vision of, of what the future events for both uh, the immediate events. Uh, really kind of for him would have been the immediacy of the next 300 some odd years for Daniel. That's what he, he's getting a vision of. Uh, but yet, as, as many of us know, 
he's also getting a vision of something that has not yet happened. Events that are going to take place in our lifetime, maybe, or in our children's lifetime. Hope not. But these events that are going on and happening. And so, this is, of course, part of this vision. He's seen uh, someone. He's seeing, actually, uh, three different people, if you think about it, as far as what's going on. He's seeing uh, a little horn that we find out is the uh, Antichrist, the beast, the man, the lawless, the man of lawlessness, as he's also known. But Daniel's attention, as we've seen, has been supplanted, of course, uh, by a vision of the Father. The Father is there in his throne room, and he's gathering his attention, and, because, and rightly so. Because Daniel, as, we, as you read through it, Daniel gets fixated on this fourth beast, this little horn. He wants to know about it, as everybody does. There's just always a fascination with wanting to know who it is, what it's about. It's always been there. Uh, when we were going through Luke there, and when he was talking about the, his uh, overview, Jesus gave an overview of the end times. And, of course, he talks about the Antichrist. And everybody wants to guess who it is. It's always been, you know, when I was a kid, they had all sorts of guests uh, uh, back in the day that people thought, well, it, Hitler, Hitler was going to be it. Or uh, the Kaiser before him or some other per person that's uh, involved, uh, you know. Uh, when I was a kid, a uh, big candidate was Henry Kissinger. That was, he, was, he was going to be the Antichrist at the time. And so we don't know. We don't know, but we have a lot of clues about them. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this when we uh, go past the throne room. Because, see, that's the whole thing. Da the Lord's getting Daniel's attention. So Daniel, uh, he thinks he's a big deal, but there's a bigger person involved here. And that's God the Father. God the Father. And uh, next week we're going to be he's going to be introducing God the Son, who is there. And he talks about the Son of Man, who is there also. Uh, the, you know, the, 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 the part of the Trinity uh, of the God the Son. And so Daniel's attention is there. And, uh, Daniel 7, 9, he gets the, uh, the Ancient of Days draws in his attention. Uh, Daniel 7, 9 is uh, on there. It's, As I looked... Thrones were placed, which talks about judgment, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and his hair and his head was like pure wool. So he's introduced those aspects about his righteousness and his wisdom, that he, he is aware of these things. Um, his throne, but then it talked about his throne having fiery flames and wheels of burning fire. We're going to come back to that in a second. The emphasis, though, in this whole event is isn't just that you get to see a strong room. It's like, oh, check out this room. It's not like God's like, hey, check out my crib here. See where I'm living. He's like, no, it's, it's, he's talking about judgment. He's like, hey, you're looking at this guy you're, who's saying a lot of great things about himself, but he's going to come to nothing. He's going to come to nothing. And that's his emphasis. That's his whole thing. He's getting Daniel's attention. He's like, Daniel, I know you're interested in this guy. We'll talk a little bit more about him, Daniel. But Daniel, you need to know who's running the show. That's the whole, that's the whole thing. That's the whole enchilada right there. And so this is where now we renew this exploration of this vision. And let's talk first about, uh, again, about God's authority and power. Because that's what he's... He's projecting. Uh, remember the throne had fiery flames. His wheels had burning flames. He, he mentions a lot of fire. Because fire is dealing, it goes after wickedness. God says he, elsewhere that he's a consuming fire. He just doesn't consume just anything. He's especially going after wickedness and evil. God himself is sinless and holy. He will not allow uh, unholiness to be in his presence. He will not allow sin to be in his presence. Which is tough for us to understand. I always appreciate this thought that in my mind I'm thinking, I just can't even imagine that. Because I still have a mind that drifts off at the places of like, where are you going, mind? And it's like, and into places where they ought not go. 
So I just can't imagine a mind that says, I am in complete service of God with no drifting off into somewhere else. That's what a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. Where we truly understand and can live in our righteousness. Right now we're living in Christ, but it's hard to see it sometimes. So here, now he talks about these fiery flames and burning fire. And in Daniel 7, 10, the first part of the verse, he talks about a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. Whoa. This is all, elsewhere, some versions will call it a river of fire. So this is a river of fire coming out. Not just any fire. This seems to display uh, what when God brings judgment, He's not just bringing a little bit of judgment. I was like, I'm just going to judge you a little. No, he's bringing full river of judgment. He's going to get the job done. That's what he's trying to speak to. So it's like uh, some people will say, well, yeah, boy, uh, when's God going to do something about evil? When, Lord, are you going to deal something? Of course, then God says, like, well, what about you? Oh, whoa, whoa, not me. Oh, everybody else is evil. But God is going to deal with it. And he's got the, the power projection to do it. He's got the rivers of consuming fire that will deal with all who are hostile to him. Everyone who deals and loves evil and loves wickedness and does not serve God. That's, he'll deal with it. That's, what's, that's what he had. I mean, he will not run out of resources. It's not like, oh, he's dealing with wickedness, dealing, dealing, dealing. Oh, no, I just don't have enough. He's got river of fire to be able to deal with it. Consider the picture uh, of this judgment the, that was given to the prophet Nahum, one of the minor prophets of God's impending judgment. In Nahum 1, verse 5 and 6, he talks about that the mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? The, his wrath is poured out like fire. And the rocks are broken in pieces by him. So here's just uh, this picture of God Nothing is going to stop him. It's just like he's, he's going past rocks. He can break it up. Mountains are going to shake and quake before him. Because he created them. That's the whole thing. Just like the whole idea. I was listening to somebody they were talking about, uh, and, and I don't agree with them theologically, but they were talking about how, you know, the, the one time when Hezekiah was, needed a sign, and God made the sun go back. And forth. They're like, all that, they, they, they suggest all that, just, that was just an illusion. Like, no! <laughs> Otherwise, they, they would have known these people were not foolish. They understood. But they also understood something else. The God who holds every molecule together by the word of his power can do whatever he wants. The earth was not going to fly apart and bust into pieces because God did something. Because God's holding it all together. Every bit of it. And so this same God that can hold it all together can bring judgment upon his creation because it is his creation. He's in charge of it. He can do that. One of the things when we think about God's judgment, because he does say he has anger uh, and he's going to go after the wicked. He's got wrath and he's got this indignation. But one of the things we want to keep in mind is that God's a judgment is not rash. It's not rash. Like, he's just like, oh, you guys, that's it. And now he goes after him. Like, no, he's not rash. He, he had set it up from the beginning. He says, hey, you do this, there's going to be wrath. And I'll bring it. And he's talked about it. That it's, uh, one person, and Peter, talks about how it's stored up. It's, it's being made ready. He gives us this picture of, uh, from the beginning in 2 Peter 3.7 where he says, um, But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist. So see, Peter's talked about the same thing I just talked about. Everything God's holding together, the word of his power holding together. He says, now exists, are stored up for fire, 
being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So in other words, God's like, he set a day. He's not like waiting. He's like, oh, well, it might be today. It depends on how angry you really get me. So it's like, no, he has a day. Just like this day, this is the day, this is the cutoff. He knows when it is. The Father knows. And that's, remember, we were talking about that, that illustration of the wedding, where the Father knew when the wedding would be. And the Son was waiting for it. And so here the Father knows, and he knows the cutoff, when that day will be, and it will be there. And so this whole judgment is there, and that's what this, this fire is speaking of, and what he's going to be bringing forward to the, to the table here down the line. But then he, then he sees something else. He goes beyond that. He starts looking around. And he sees the angels. The heavenly beings that are there. And Daniel's going to have some other encounters with these angels down the line. And then come up with other visions. Especially with the, the angel Gabriel. Who then also refers to the angel Michael. And, and what they're doing. Uh, but there's this sphere of existence that's out there. That you and I, we, we know about... Uh, but that's about it. Because like even today, there's probably angels here. We just don't see them. They're in business. They, they said they're ministering to, our, to us, to his saints. That's what they do. They minister and serve us. We just don't see them. Because, it, because honestly, they don't want to be seen. They don't want to be seen because us human beings are too inclined to start worshiping them. They, they're like, no, no, no. Constantly pointing to the Lord. And that's, so we see these angelic beings. And of course, we're, these beings that we see tell us something else about what's going on. Because see, that's one of the things we have to always remember is that when we were born again into Christ, we were born into a new world. You're like, well, I was born on earth. But the problem is, is now we exist in, a, in the, for another world. We're part of another kingdom that, that's out there. But the thing is, is this kingdom on earth and that kingdom are at war. There's a battle going on. That's why it's, it's one of our temptations is to get too comfortable. We were talking about this the other day. It's just like people, uh, I suggest, and it's easy to do. We worship safety. God, like, you're not in a safe zone. This is all a yellow and red zone. This, this earth is very unsafe. Not just physically, you know, where you go on the, don't play in the street because you get hit by a car. But it's spiritually unsafe. Don't go there, child, because you will be ravaged in your heart and soul by the enemy when you go there. This ravaging that is there, this battle that is going on around us. We've got to remember that and be aware of it. So Daniel is given this glimpse of this reality and the view of the ancient of days being served in worship. And Daniel 7.10b, uh, if you will, says, And a thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And of course... These are the holy ones, as described in Moses, as revealed to Moses in Deuteronomy 33, when he talks about how, who the Lord was using often to protect Israel. And uh, Deuteronomy 33, 2, he says, he said, that would be Moses, that the Lord came from Sinai and dawned upon, from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire in his right hand. So these are his angelic servants. And he gives them number upon number. In other words, the whole idea is that like you like count it up and say, oh, it's this many. It's like, no, the whole idea is like there's more than he can count. That's the idea. That's the description. That's what he's getting at. There's more than he can count. So often this is referred to as the host of heaven as observed by another prophet who had glimpsed them from the throne room. Uh, this would have been the prophet Micaiah when uh, he was uh, 
giving a pronouncement to one of the kings. In 1 Kings 22, verse 19, it says, And Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. He said, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. What he's getting at in this host, of course, is the armies. I love Chris Tomlin's song, The God of Angel Armies is on my side. And that's the whole idea. This is the angel army. So it's when it says the Lord of hosts, it's, we could translate it the Lord of armies. Again, what's trying to be understood here is he's seeing a throne room. He's got fire and flames all around it. So he's got power and authority to deal with that. But he's also got this power of this group of angels that are there to going to execute his orders. And if any of you are familiar with the book of Revelation, you know angels are running around doing all sorts of stuff in the book of Revelation, bringing about God's final plan of judgment. They're, they're blowing horns, they're causing havoc, they're, they're everywhere. So the, the angels are doing his will. And the whole point is he's showing Daniel, again, you have to remember Daniel, is, he, was, he, he has one eye on this beast, God's drawing his eyes over to the throne room. He's like, hey, pay attention to this. Daniel, pay attention. This is what's going on. And he's trying to show him, like, Daniel, this guy may think he's big and bad, but I'm badder. And I can bring it. I have authority and power to be able to execute what I want to have happen. And if something's going to happen. He's telling him that. He's getting him understood. And he's revealing his future will because in Daniel 7.10, see, as he's continuing on, he says, and this court, every, all these seats are put up, sat in judgment. And there it is. So it's telling us what this is about. This is judgment. It's happening right here. He's judging, going to be judging this little horn, this, this antichrist. He says, this guy thinks he's all that, but I'm his judge. Like a criminal walking into a courtroom like, yeah, I'm the criminal. Here I am. I'm going to run this show. Meanwhile, the judge pops in and he says, Bailiff, get that guy straightened out. And he gets straightened out because the judge is running the show. <laughs> like, that's the way it is. And so this is what's going on. There's the courts had a judgment and the books were open. And of course, this is a huge, sobering picture of accountability. These books. These books are going to be open. The deeds of this horrific king and his kingdom are going to be opened and exposed. Everything is there. He's going to tell them, this is what you did. We were watching everything that you were doing. And there will be recompense for it. As the Lord later reveals to Daniel, there's uh, other incomes. Because there's books not only on this guy, but for everyone. Every one of us has a record, if you will. Daniel says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 2, it says, But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Most of you already know which book that is. And he says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there's, there's a destiny here. Two different ones. Of course, the positive book that's being talked about is the book of life. It's also mentioned by the last prophet of the Old Testament, Malachi. Malachi 3.16, it says, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. So that's the whole idea. There's this book. Book of, for all these people. So when you serve the Lord, he remembers. When you follow the Lord, he remembers. It's like, uh, and, and that's the thing, because sometimes when you're serving the Lord, you don't see anything. You don't see any reward. You don't see anything happening. As a Bible teacher, I understand that. I'm up here, you know, we talk about, we joke about the um, herding cats, but the results are always 
Well, there's, sometimes there's some instantaneous results, but very few. It's always a long haul. Long haul thing. And you know what? The, the things I bring to your life by teaching the word of God, I might not ever see. But I have to believe it and trust it that God is at work and God sees. And of course, the students of prophecy recognize a future event called the Great White Man <coughs> Judgment. This is described in Revelation chapter 20. And it's where he says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Here's the throne room again. And the books were open. In fact, what God is giving Daniel is a preview. This is the same event. He's giving a preview of the same event. Books were open, another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. So now there seems to be an interesting thing here. There's, there's these books of deeds, then there's this book of life. Two different books. And that is exciting and comforting. Because if I was to go before this throne with on my deeds... I'd be in trouble, and not just me, it would be everybody. Everybody would be in trouble, because even the best of our deeds fall short. So we need something else. And that's why I love the good news that Paul shares in, in his letter to the Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, and he says, And you, that'd be me, and you, and you, and you, and you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by doing what? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us in this legal demand. That is exciting stuff. And this he set aside. What did he do? But see, he just didn't set it aside. What did he do with it? He nailed it to the cross. All those things nailed to the cross. Now, I don't want to get on the rabbit trail, but we've talked about rewards because we're still going to be, God's still going to take a look at our lives as Christians. But it's not, not for salvation, it's for rewards. It's what we do with, with our salvation. What we build on his foundation. Because his is the solid foundation. That's what he's going to be looking at. But because of what he's done, our names are written in the book of life. So this record, his record is there. He's paying attention to what this guy is saying, what this beast, what this little horn has been saying. And now his focus is, is not on all of humanity. His focus is on this beast, this Antichrist, and what he's going to do. This beast gets dealt with. What's interesting in this, as Daniel goes and proceeds on this, is Daniel gets distracted again. Says, it says in Daniel 7, 11, it says, I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. In other words, this, this horn, this beast just was yammering on about how great it was. And not just lightly like, yeah, I'm pretty great. I'm pretty awesome. He was speaking it out as loud as he could. He's trying to juxtapose himself against the judge. And so, in my mind, it's just like, man, Dan Daniel just is just like being pulled away by this. Because he says, and I look, there it is, this guy, because of the sound. I just want to talk about distractions for the moment. As, as this morning, as the, you know, we get distractions, that happens. I understand. But it's interesting to think about distractions of, of life. Yes. Because you know what? They can, distractions actually can be at both a tool and a weapon, a little bit of both. As a weapon, a distraction can misguide our minds from important priorities, right? Distraction from priorities. Think about uh, Martha when, uh, when Jesus was showing up there to, to, at the house and she's in the kitchen doing everything and she was, and it even says she was distracted by that. And she's like, Jesus, be Mary, come and help me. 
But she, she's like, no, she's got the bigger priorities in mind. So distraction can misguide our mind away from priorities. Distraction can misguide our mind away from what's true. You see that like with Jacob lying to his father, he distracted him by disguising and stuff to distract him from that truth. We see this all the time. This is nothing new. We see this around us. We've talked about we're giving politicians a hard time last week, and we can still give them a hard time because that's part of the idea of politics. Is you distract everybody else by making your other guy look worse than you. And of course they're saying the same thing. They're, they're just as bad. And they use distraction. Hey, nothing to see here. Look at that. Well, disaster's happening right here that they don't know how to figure out. That, that's what they do. That's what happens. They're, and we do it. No, oh, my car's not burning on fire. Hey, look, an eagle. You know, just like, that's what we do. Distract, distractions misguide us, misguide our mind on the journey of faith. That's not, so often we're, what do we pray for? It's like, Lord, guide our steps. Lord, guide our steps and on the journey of faith. And uh, sometimes, think about Nehemiah when he was there to rebuild the walls. And he's trying to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem where they've gotten wiped out. And he shows up with all his crew and all his materials, but there's these guys there trying to keep him from doing it. It's like, what are you doing here? If you build these walls, they're going to come and get you. You need to not build the wall. They were trying to distract him from what he was called to do. Scary. Now, as a tool, distraction can sometimes take our minds off of momentary intense pain. You know, when things are, life is painful, maybe physical pain, you can forget about it with a distraction. It's amazing how the God created our mind to do that. You know, I just think about, like, you know, we... Definitely are fans of this show talk, uh, talking about midwif as British they call it midwifery is what they call it. <laughs> I just laugh about that. But the whole idea is like the mother is giving birth in immense pain, there is struggle and everything, but the moment the baby's born, they're completely distracted by the baby now. It's like the event wasn't even there. Just it's just amazing. Uh, distraction can relax our mind from overthinking. We tell people that. We get people just like in the zone and they're thinking and they're just like getting crazy and you're just like, hey, 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 look, an eagle. <laughs> get them to, to relax for a second. And so distraction can be used to get your mind off of something that's just tearing you apart. Distraction can be used uh, to guide our minds from harmful things, which is what God's trying to do in this moment with Daniel. Because the, the very thing is like when temptation comes, a good distraction is to turn our minds to the Lord. Amen. And that's when you sit there and say, uh, yeah, when the, there's temptation, and this, I love how you have know, chat with folks that talk about where we just try to struggle. No, what you do is you remember your first love. When the temptation is coming, it's like, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. And we get our mind distracted on the right direction. And so this time, where Daniel's dealing with this guy, this guy's speaking out these great things about how awesome he is to get Daniel's attention off of, distract him from the throne room of what's going on. What would these great words be? That's kind of an interesting thought. In Revelation 13, verses 5 and 6, uh, we talked about verse 5 last week about the beast and how he would say things. Uh, and it says that in verse 5, and when the beast was given a mouth utterly haughty, those, uh, we talked about that, those great things, blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. And it opened its mouth, in verse 6, to utter blasphemies against God blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. So here's a clue to what this little horn is saying about God and against him. 
He's, he's disrespecting God's name and disrespecting the heaven. We encounter blasphemies ourselves. Not just when somebody uses God's name as a cuss word, but there's other blasphemies that we encounter that, that can be whispered to our hearts, and whispered to our souls. And the enemy whispers blasphemies to us. What are some of those that we can encounter? Here, I've got a, a, just a short list. First one that we encounter, God is weak or impotent in power. That's a blasphemy that we whisper to our hearts. Sometimes it's shouted to our hearts. When we get in those situations, we're like, oh, Lord, I need you to, I need you to be able to do something here because I can't. And the voice will come in, God's weak. God's powerless. Shouting blasphemies or whispering blasphemies in our hearts. Or next, this town right out of the gate in the garden. God is a liar. He's not telling you the truth. God's a liar. And he can't be trusted. That's blasphemous thoughts. That we need to understand right away. Right away. No, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not, that's not right stuff. You can get more subtle. Next one. God only, God only wants to hurt us. He does not care. Let's be honest. I know I've heard these. And those are blasphemies about God. God just wants to hurt you. And doesn't care. Of course he cares. Blasphemous thoughts. And this one we kind of run into nowadays. Even shouted at us. Not just from uh, uh, the heavenly enemies. But against even those around us. They're trying to convince us of this. That God only hates and has no love. God only hates. As they're trying to convince us of. It's because you know, God has rules. Because God is holy and righteous. That nowadays that is looked at as hate. That's blasphemous thoughts. Because God is love. So you can imagine, this is a picture of the scene. Daniel's eyes are getting getting drawn and he's listening and looking at this, this little horn that is just saying all these things against God and against heaven and against against his character and everything else that he's going after and saying that. And in mid-speech, God deals with him. Because it says in Daniel 7, 11, and it says, and as I looked, the beast was killed. One of those literally, shut your trap. Done, done. Wiped out. The beast will similarly be dealt with at the end of time. In Revelation 19, verse 20, it says, And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, his crony, who in his presence had done signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burned with sulfur. So you can imagine at that moment, when we're there and seeing the courtroom scene, watching this scene play out, and he's railing against God. God just dump, put in the dumpster, the fire dumpster, just right in, probably right, right in, like, ah, ah, ah. shut up, right away, get them out of there. This is a place that where he's going, and just like Isaiah describes it when he was describing Israel's enemies in Syria and how they were going to get dealt with and how they were going to use it, how the Lord uses, uses them to discipline Israel. In Isaiah 30, verse 33, it says, For a burning place has been long, has long been prepared. Indeed, for the king, has, is, it is made ready. Its pyre made deep and wide with fire and wood in abundance. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of sulfur, kindles it. In other words, yeah, this fire, it, it, it's, it's an everlasting fire. 
I always love the, the thing. It's like whenever the devil reminds you of, his, of our past, remind him of his future. It's just like this is his future. This is what he's got ahead of him. And uh, it, this, this all is happening. That this, we're going to see down the line is we're going to get reiterated. Because God, is, God wants to reiterate this. He's like, no. This, this guy operates on fear and deception, distraction, all these things. But the biggest thing is, even Daniel, in the end of this, he's anxious and he's worried and he's concerned. That's part of the fear, but God's trying to show him. It's just like, no, I'm going to take care of this guy. Yet something else, as we see it, we saw in the second revelation just a second ago, that these guys were thrown away, but something else is still there. Someone else is still there. And, of course, his end is displayed in the end of the millennial kingdom. Revelation 20, verse 10. It says, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's the thing. Again, when you see these folks that have little pictures, they show the demons and stuff running hell. That is not true. They, hear, they don't run hell. They're not in hell right now. They're in, trapped on this earth trying to do whatever they're going to do. You know, subvert God's plan to go against his people. God has them here. So they're not in hell right now. They will be. And they won't be running the show. So that's something to keep in mind. Revelation uh, 20 continues on, verse 14 and 15. It says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. In the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So there it is. Everyone, you know, when they looked at the deeds and everything, if you're just judged by your deeds, and if you're not in the book of life, this is the destiny. Now it's kind of interesting how he ends this little section before he starts to talk about the Son of Man. Because then in verse 12, in Daniel 7, 12, he says, As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Very interesting statement. I was like, well, what do you go and what, why would he say that? Then it occurred to me that, remember when we were talking about it, when he's first looking at these beasts, and he understands the world governments and cultures and everything that's going on and their influence, these other kingdoms live on today. Like I said, in America, we have vestiges of all those other kingdoms. We have borrowed and put together very uh, providentially, pragmatically, uh, so many things that we borrowed from those other cultures that's still here. So the shadows of those guys are still around. They just don't have a dominion. We don't have a Babylonian Empire. We don't have a medieval Persian Empire. We don't have a Greek Empire around. But their influences are still here, even today. So that's what he's getting at. But even them, their time is coming to an end. All of that is going to come to an end as, as he's going to introduce uh, the, someone who's going to take dominion. We'll talk about him next week, the Son of Man. Jesus, the Son of God. He is going to, as Daniel saw earlier when he saw through Nebuchadnezzar's vision, remember Nebuchadnezzar had a vision too about the statue, and the bottom of the statue had this thing with the, the toes that were made of iron and clay, and what happened? He said a mountain, not made with hands or anything by them, came and wiped that out. Well, guess who the mountain is? Be Jesus. And we'll wipe them all out. It's tough to think about judgment. I heard some really good thinkers that really challenged me about thinking about how I think about that. Because on one level, it's just like when we look outside, we go to the store, driving on the freeway, 
So many of the people going past us to and fro doing their thing are, are headed towards judgment. And that should be a sobering thought. I remember we had a discussion the other day, and there's some theologians that try to downplay it, try to remove the eternality of the judgment. I think the Bible militates against that. The Bible talks about that the judgment of God, you will exist in it eternally. I don't believe in it, what's called annihilationalism. The Bible doesn't seem to agree with that. But that means then that there's neighbors and friends that are headed towards an eternal existence separated from God. And it won't be a fun one. It will be fire and pain because of their rejection of the Savior. And that, that, can be, that can be emotionally tough. But also at the same time, it should motivate us motivate us to be praying for the lost to pray for these folks to pray for the Lord to open up their minds and open up their hearts to the truth of his gospel but at the, also at the same time when we've experienced horrific wickedness because I can imagine in some areas where they, you know, family members have been killed and they're like God when are you going to do something about this and how they see judgment they're like, man, Lord, we want you to deal with these folks that do not love you and are just wicked. Told us not to hate them. Told us to love them, but Lord, I still want you to get rid of them. Because they're not, they're not good. So I can understand that too. It's more nuanced than what we would like to think sometimes. But in the Psalms, David captures the thought of of an attitude of God's judgment. And he says in verse in Psalm 96, verse 11 to 13, he says, Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar in all that fills it. Let the field exalt and everything in it. Then all the trees of the forest sing for joy, for the Lord, he, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and his peoples in faithfulness. So there it is. See, because part of that, when you see what's going on, all the creation, because once again, when, when we're thinking about the awfulness of what the judgment will be, there's also a goodness about it. Because it's going to be a righteous judgment. He's going to judge it in rightfulness, righteousness and faithfulness. And that's a good thing. All the world wants it. See, that's part of it where our human existence right now can hardly understand it. Because let's face it, when, when it was time for me to get a spanking, I was never happy about it. <laughs> like, it, it's bad news. But for us, when we realize that the world is going to, the world and especially the enemy is going to get his, his eternal spanking, that's a thought, isn't it? But that is a good thing that I can't even fully register because of the joy that all of creation will know. Because see, that's one of the things when it says, Paul in Romans chapter 8, where he says, creation is groaning. We don't necessarily see it, but God sees it. And he says, the creation is groaning because of what's going on around us. It's hard for us to even perceive it. God, when he comes and brings judgment, he's going to put it all back together again. And that's why the world has joy. But at the same time, it can be very costly. But for you and I, we can be comforted. I alluded to before, and Jesus talked about it. Remember when the guy went out and they, he sent them out two by two and doing stuff and they came back with a report like, look at what we did. Look at what, and 
Jesus, in your name, we let all this happen. This is, this is amazing. Even demons are obeying our voices and getting out of people. This is fantastic. But Jesus reminds them of the most important thing. He says in Luke 10, 20, he says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that spirits are subject, subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's the rejoice in the which... Thank the Lord, I am supremely glad. And it wasn't written because I got hold of the pen. It's written by the very love of God and in the blood of Christ. So Father God, as we think about these things, these sobering realities, Father, I pray that, Lord, you would move in our hearts. Give us eyes to see these realities, the reality of a spiritual battle that's going on around us, what it means to, to our lives and our hearts and our motivations. Father, give us, give us eyes to see the lost, to not just walk past them, to not just, oh, they're in their house or they're just in line at the store, and they're just doing their things. But Lord, I pray that we would see them. We would see the lost. And we would have your heart of love for them. But Lord, even if we, we can't say anything, that we pray for them when we see them. We pray for the scales to come off their eyes. That they would see the light of the glory of Jesus Christ, that they would understand their need for redemption and grace and forgiveness found only in Jesus. Father, I pray for that. I pray for this, this city and this valley, Lord, that, Lord, truly you would open up, open up hearts, open up minds. And, Lord, help us to pray and to open up our mouths to speak of you, and to point to Christ. Lord, help us to do that. And we just praise you, Father, because of your work, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, and because we've trusted that, that our names are written in the book of life. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's worship the Lord. In Jesus' name.